<laughs> right? I, I hope that you're going to invite friends to come to church here uh, next week. We are going to have two opportunities to worship. One is going to be at 7 a.m. It's a sunrise service at Donnie and Chris Browder's house. Um, the address for, for that is in our newsletter, and it's also on our website. And we will be worshiping in here at 10.30 a.m. Um, I invite you to come a little early, probably next week, because I'm anticipating we'll be invite you folks here. Um, you'll notice in your bulletin that there is a little um, envelope insert. Um, that is to collect for our pastor's um, community assistance fund. This is formally in the future. It's not in the bulletin. It's in the pews. So Richard has told me. Um, there's something in the pews. Basically, this is a collection for the community assistance fund, which um, is an opportunity for our church, whenever somebody comes by our office uh, who needs emergency assistance, it's an opportunity for us to be able to say yes to them. If they have an emergency need for a power bill, if they need work clothes, if they need food or, or even shelter, we can work to, to provide that, um, or at least provide them with resources to meet an immediate an emergency need. So uh, we're going to have envelopes in the pews the next few Sundays. I invite you to contribute to that. Um, it's, a, it's a great way for us to be in ministry with folks who come by during the week. Um, also, there are clipboards on each end of your pew. I invite you to record your attendance business. If you're new, I, I want to welcome you and extend a special welcome to you and invite you to put some of your contact information. We, I would love to be in touch with you this week, um, maybe to schedule a coffee or, or a lunch or something like that, just to get to know you. Um, also, if you provided food for me and Julie while we were on uh, leave, I want to say thank you so much. And your dishes, which you provided for us, which I have kept for far too long, and you have told me that, um, those dishes are in our welcome center. So if I've held one of your dishes hostage, so sorry, uh, that will be available for you um, in our welcome center to take home. Uh, for Easter, if you're going to be doing any cooking. Uh, those of you at home, I invite you to please record your attendance um, online, register at our website, oneumcm.com. Uh, we're not using Facebook to live stream anymore. We're using YouTube. So, uh, well, and it's working. And it's working, which is good. <laughs> we're happy about that. Um, so, anyway, if you can register your attendance while you're watching, that would be wonderful. Um, the blessing box uh, behind our, our church and also the Good Shepherd Center always could use your donations. So I invite you to, to give to that. Are there any announcements that I've missed this morning? All right. Well, I invite you um, to greet members of our own church family and those who are attending online by giving a wave. Um, may, the priest, may the peace of Christ be with you.
I invite you to stand and join me in our words of invitation. Awake. Some of y'all may need me to say that again. <laughs> Awake to the day of triumph for our Savior. We give thanks to this day that leads to the cross. Come with your branches, hosannas and song. We fill the air with welcome to the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom. Hosanna in the highest. That's for our opening hymn.
The Lord God helps us. Who can declare us guilty? Sisters and brothers, beyond the shadow of doubt, your sins are forgiven. By the mercy of Christ, let us stand together, forgiven and free. Amen. <laughs> As you know, we've got a few prayer requests that are present within our bulletin. Um, I'm going to kind of look over and pray over, I hope, this week. Um, there are a few folks that I want to raise up for you all. Um, Jen Johnson let Sue know, uh, I think yesterday, that her brother-in-law, Tim Johnson, had a fall uh, at a wedding venue and was taken to Bolton Memorial Hospital. Had um, Okay, yeah. What kind of fracture? He broke his hip. He had a hip fracture last night. So I invite you to be in prayer for them and that family. Um, Carol Peters is asking for prayers for Dr. Mike McCoy, who has some serious health issues. Also, I invite you to pray for uh, Roger and Lori McNeese. Roger is not here with us. Lori is. Um, Roger became very ill late Wednesday and ended up having an emergency appendectomy Thursday morning. Um, but as far as we know, he's doing okay. He's recovering okay. So, but we want to be in prayer for them. Also, be in prayer for local attorney Clifford Wilson and family, uh, who's dealing with some health issues right now. Um, now, might also continue to pray for Faye Watson and Kim and her and their whole family. Um, they are going through quite a lot with Faye. I got to see Faye in the hospital last week on Thursday and pray with her. And it was good to be able to do that and to, to have that time with both of them. But um, I just invite you to pray for that family. If you know them or if you know him, I invite you to reach out to her and for just an encouraging work of love. Um, also be in prayer for Sam Grubb and family. Sam was taken to the ER um, in Athens, uh, I think Friday. Thursday night or Friday. <coughs> Friday. Um, and was admitted and um, is going to continue to stay in the hospital, at least until tomorrow, is my understanding. Um, just out of some, some concerns. Are there other prayer concerns that you all have that I haven't raised up for us this morning? Well, as always, I invite you to join me here uh, at the kneeler if you would like. To join me in prayer. Uh, let us go to God in prayer together. God of transformation, we are reminded this day that Jesus' ride into Jerusalem was more than a show. More than a simple provocation and more than the beginning of acute celebration. It was a signal that things are changing. An unmistakably potent message to the powers that be that the world as we know it is becoming the world as it should be. It was a radical act of defiance directed against those in his day who wielded power in violence, oppression, Purity. It is no less radical and no less pain for those who do the same today. This simple ride reminds us and tells the whole world that you are indeed coming to make all things new. You're coming to turn weapons of war into instruments of peace. You are coming to release those who find themselves in all manners of bondage. Chains of injustice, chains of addiction, chains of conformity and apathy. You are coming to provide for the poor, food for the hungry, and shelter for the homeless. You are coming to ensure the dignity and equality of all who are marginalized. You are coming to end violence and divisions, to provide safe communities and opportunities for education. You are coming to offer healing and wholeness, and comfort, consolation, and hope. You are coming to transform all that we know. You are coming to save us. <coughs> but like Jesus, humbly riding into town on a lowly colt, 
you aren't coming in grandeur. You aren't coming with thunder and lightning. You aren't making an epic entrance. You're coming through the mystery of love incarnate. Through your church, through us, empowered by your spirit, through lives transformed and inspired, through ordinary people, blessed by you to do extraordinary things. Come, gracious God, into a world that longs for change, a world that needs your love, a world full of your own children, a world ripe with hope and potential. Blessed are those who come in your name, O oh God. We have come. We will go. And now we pray. We pray for your coming kingdom emerging all around us. <coughs> Using the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Please join us in the hymn of meditation, 277. Tell me the stories of Jesus. Let's stand for this one. Jerusalem. Good job. 
And people were waving branches just like this and welcoming him. These palm branches are a sign from a really long time ago about a king. And they would say big, loud words like Hosanna. Can you say Hosanna? Hosanna. Can you say it again? Hosanna. Okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to yell as loud as you can. Okay, and I know your parents told you not to yell in church, but it's okay. We're going to do it right. Um, so I'm going to say one, two, three, and I want you to yell, okay? One, two, three. Hosanna! You can do louder than that. Would y'all help them? Can you help them? All right. One, two, three. Hosanna! Beautiful. That was really good. It was even louder on the day that Jesus was part of his life. Now, you're going to learn more about that with Aaron uh, as she takes y'all to, to first steps, okay? But first, before you do that, I want to invite you to pray with me, okay? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this for these children, for their energy, for the way that they see the world. Lord God, help us to see the world as they do, um, and to see your kingdom in the world as they do. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen, y'all. Thank you for joining me up here, and thank you for walking in with your palms, okay? I want to invite you to, to go over there in the back. Friends, we're blessed on so many different levels uh, and in so many different ways. I invite you now to bless the ministry to the church as we have to, uh, to the giving of our tithes and our offerings.
says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside of the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said. And they allowed, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it. And he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Well, on a spring day in the year 30, a column of heavily armored Roman soldiers marched down a dusty road toward Jerusalem. They marched right into the front gates of the city in a massive and intimidating display. There were good soldiers marching four across and mounted cavalry on horses before them. The soldiers would have carried swords and shields and bows and spears and axes. Their armor would have reflected the sun brightly, and their marching would have been to the beat of loud drums. At the front of this column, mounted on the highest horse, would have been Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of all the neighboring regions and the representative of Emperor Tiberius himself. It had become common practice for the Roman military to march into the city of Jerusalem during major festivals in the Jewish year. And the week of Passover was no different. The most sacred week in the Jewish year. Pilate was bringing his military power to Jerusalem as a show of force to support the Roman garrison there. The march into the city was intended to be a demonstration of Roman imperial might. It was to act as a reminder to the Jewish people not to get any bright ideas about resisting Roman authority. Since Passover itself is a celebration of liberation from an earlier empire. 
Now, y'all see on the map where the first notch is, just above the square, it says Jerusalem in the time of Jesus. That's close to the main gate of Jerusalem. And that's where the Romans would have marched in. You know, the common people in the city would have come to expect this parade every year, the same thing. Just like when we see baskets at Easter or lights at Christmas, they would have come to expect this as part of this season. Now imagine the people in town watching the soldiers come in in awe and, and maybe even a little resentful because this procession not only showcased Rome's military, it also was a reminder of Roman theology. The Romans wanted to remind the Jews that their emperor was not only the ruler of Rome, but also the most powerful God on earth. Because to them, he was the son of God. During this huge show of force, a counter procession was being planned on the backside of the city, toward the east, near the Mount of Olives. And this is where we intersect with our text for today. See, Jesus is planning something truly, truly awesome for his ministry and for his followers and for all the people of Jerusalem. He is planning to intentionally fulfill a long-held prophecy that will reveal him to be the long-awaited king. He's planning to show that he is the true son of God and a new kind of ruler. See, in the Old Testament book of Zechariah, there is a verse that says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey. On a colt, the foal of a donkey. The words Zechariah offers are an elaboration from an earlier prophecy from the patriarch Jacob out of the book of Genesis. It talks about how a new ruler of Judah and for the whole world would reveal himself. And this imagery of cult and foal is there as well. In our text for this morning, Jesus is clear with his disciples. He sends them ahead of him to the next village to find a cult or a foal. A horse that is young and innocent in many ways. A total contrast from the war horses of, of Rome. The, the disciples find one and bring it back to him, and he climbs on. Then he begins to ride down the mountain toward the back gates of Jerusalem. Now, y'all see where it says number 11 at the top of this. That's where Jesus is. And he's coming down the mountain from the Mount of Olives, from the Mount of Olives to come into town back that way. To the disciples and the people of the city, Jesus' procession was an obvious reversal to the might of Rome that was displayed at the main gates. Just seeing a peasant-class man riding on a foal down the hill with people shouting all around him would have struck people as an obvious slight to Rome, that annual celebration that happens where they come into town. And it was probably, honestly, hilarious to behold. But there is something deeper happening. The cult is a well-known sign to the Jewish people of a long-expected king. The king that will bring about a new reign of peace. In our prophecy from, from Zechariah, uh, we learned how the new king would arrive. But just after that verse in verse 10, it says... He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the <coughs> earth. That's what this rain looks like. This king riding on a colt or donkey will banish war from the land. No more chariots, or war horses, or swords. <coughs> His very nature will command and embody peace to the nations. 
and he will be the ruler of peace. This is what the prophecy points to. And this is the prophecy that Jesus deliberately seeks to fulfill as he enters the city of Jerusalem on the week of his crucifixion. As Jesus marches down the path in his own way, the people recognize him as the prophesied king. This would have been a well-known story, almost as well-known as Star Wars is to many of us. And they act in a way that people respond in a way that is reminiscent of how other Israelite kings are on by throwing cloaks on the road and throwing down branches for his procession. The crowd gains momentum. Now imagine the enthusiasm building and the crowd growing as some shout hosannas and others yell, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. For blessed is the, king, is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. There's so much support. So much support and so much excitement. There was a lot of praise as Jesus came into Jerusalem triumphant. But this moment is not triumphant because of the crowd or their shouts. Or even because he has revealed that he is the one who was spoken of from so long ago. His entry is triumphant because of his obedience to God's plan. For him. Jesus is going into Jerusalem as the king of peace, but he's about to experience incredible violence. He is the king of peace in total contrast to the display of Roman imperial might happening on the other side of the city. And he is going along simply, humbly, and I dare say even confident to face his death. He is going to face being betrayed and suffer at the hands of people who are human, just like us. Jesus is going to face his crucifixion, and many who are shouting around him, praising him as their king, and going with him along the road will not be with him. In the end, this I dare say. Is where we intersect with our passage for this morning. Each year we recognize Jesus' journey into Jerusalem as the beginning of Holy Week. We wait pause and we celebrate joyfully with our children. But at its heart, Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem is a simple invitation to be more obedient to him. In our minds and hearts, we can hear the crowds shouting around him for this humble king. They are caught up in the excitement about him and what he represents. But then we all know how the story ends. The question for all of us gathered here this morning on this Palm Sunday, the question that I want you to ask yourselves is where will you be standing? When Jesus Christ isn't popular. When a crowd isn't gathered around him in praise. In those moments, in those moments, will you be loyal and obedient to him? When the world despises him and twists his words for their own benefit, is indifferent to him, beats him, breaks his heart and his body. And even makes him suffer. But when he becomes reviled and unpopular, and people ask you, who is your God? Or people ask, weren't you one of those Christians, one of those followers of Jesus? What will you say then? Today's journey is supposed to be fun, and it is. It's beautiful and filled with enthusiasm. But it should also give us pause. Jesus is going into Jerusalem to meet the suffering and death that awaits him. And which he's called toward. And his entry into Jerusalem is triumphant because he is obedient in this. He 
was obedient to his death to save you. And all of us. He is your redeemer. Your savior. By his death on the cross, he enacts God's grace for all of us. He is our rightful king and the king of peace. And as the shouts of the crowd die away and the enthusiasm wanes, what will you do then? Will you be one of those who peel off from the crowd, forgetting about him, indifferent to him, or even forgetting who he is? Will you seek to disassociate from him as you as you hear those around shout, crucify him, crucify him? Or will you stay with him through this journey? Will you be loyal to him no matter what the world says? With your hope placed squarely upon him, upon his sacrifice, upon his being nailed to the cross. And when you keep watch in the days ahead, in this holy week, waiting in faith for him to be resurrected. To be a Christian means to follow Jesus boldly and unapologetically, even as the world rejects him and the gift of salvation. It means sticking with him, even when you find yourself in the darkest and loneliest of places. It means being obedient to him no matter the cost. Because our shared hope, your redemption and salvation, ultimately cost a man his life. But through his death, new life will burst forth gloriously in the world. But not yet. The question for us today is how will you Draw even closer to him than you already are. How can you bring his kingdom of peace, the kingdom of peace he envisioned, to life right where you are? How can you show your obedience to him in a world that so often reviles him, and ignores him, and rejects his sacrifice for us? How close will you stick by him this holy week. In the name of the Almighty God, who is Yahweh, and of the crucified one, who is Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, who resurrects. Amen. I invite you to stand and join me in our closing.
So you all should have gotten that, the first one this morning. Um, hopefully, if you, if you didn't, just let me or Richard know. We'll try to get you signed up for that. Um, now, I invite you to receive the benediction. Let us go forth from this place, returning no one evil for evil, but only good. Let us go forth with the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 